Thanks very much indeed for coming along tonight, and um, I hope you'll be challenged um, by what I have to bring. Um, I would like to start by word of uh, personal testimony in a sense, because when I was an undergraduate, which is some while ago, um, and I was um, studying ancient history and classical studies, that's what I end up qualifying and teaching and uh, researching in. And uh, when I was going through the classical philosophers, uh, Greek philosophers, I kept coming across references which caught my attention, which seemed to be uh, earlier understandings pointing towards evolutionary theory. So I sort of collected a few of those references, didn't do much more about it at the time, and, um, but it kept buzzing away in the back of my mind over, over a number of years. And it was in the last years I began to seriously dig around and uh, go on a quest, researching, particularly in the last three years in the National Library here in Edinburgh, and uh, tracing things through. Um, so it's actually been, I suppose, on and off, a 25-year search for me. And uh, what I discovered caused me to have a long look at my understanding of evolutionary theory. Now, just looking at this, this first slide, exposing the roots of evolution, part one. Uh, so you might be different positions tonight. You might think, well, you don't necessarily agree with evolution or you partly agree with it, or you might think it's absolutely fantastic and it's foolproof and um, it's sort of like two plus two is four or the law of gravity or something like that. Well, I want to give you, first of all, um, a quotation from Julian Huxley, who was uh, descended from Charles Darwin, uh, sorry, from uh, Thomas Huxley, who was Charles Darwin's bulldog. Uh, that was, he was a main spokesman for Charles Darwin at the time. He said, Darwin's theory is no longer a theory, but a fact. And it might be that some of you are absolutely convinced of that. And that's one position. However, some scientists take a completely different view, in particular in the last 10 years. Here's a quotation by uh, Professor James Shapiro, who's a, a leading bacteriologist, University of Chicago. He says, for those scientists who take it seriously, Darwinian evolution has functioned more as a philosophical belief than as a testable scientific hypothesis. This quasi-religious function of the theory is, I think, what lies behind many of the extreme statements that you have doubtless encountered from some scientists opposing any criticism of neo-Darwinism in the classroom. It is also why many scientists make public statements about the theory that they would not defend privately to other scientists like me. Now, that is quite a challenging quotation. Um, and I don't know how you regard that, whether your blood's boiling or what's going on when you see a quotation from a leading scientist. As far as I know, he has no particular religious axe to grind whatsoever. Uh, but this is, this is his observation as a scientist. Before we get into the talk, I really want to look at what is evolution um, to make sure that we're actually batting on the same wicket, as it were. Um, and so I've taken an Oxford English Dictionary definition. The origination of living things by development from earlier forms, not by special creation. In other words, there's been a pro long process from amoeba through to philosophers to us today, uh, but not any divine supernatural in intervention that brought it together in the first place. Now, I regard natural selection and adaptation as being very clear scientific principles because they can be observed, they can be repeated, um, and they can be examined thoroughly. However, the theory of evolution is actually really quite open because the fact is it's impossible yet to recreate a universe and to observe everything happening and uh, take notes on it so we can actually are... We can assume things, we can aim at things, we can have a good sort of intelligent guess at things, but we cannot say necessarily that evolution and its whole thing from the cosmos right through to biological evolution is concrete science. The purpose of this talk though is not really to look into the science of it. Other people uh, speak on this subject and last week we had Professor John Walton from St Andrews um, who was speaking on the uh, origins of life, um, was it evolved or did it, was it designed? And by the way, you can, look, you can click onto his talk, which is now available on, web, on our website, edinburghcreationgroup.org. Uh, but I'm here to demonstrate that evolution has its roots in an ancient philosophy 
going back thousands of years and to trace that philosophy to its modern day form. Now, you might think that uh, it all began with Charles Darwin. I remember studying biology at school and I thought, that was it. Charles Darwin was this amazing scientist. He went off to the Galapagos Islands and studied uh, wildlife out there. And he wrote his book, Origin of Species, and published in 1859, had a world impact. And I thought it all originated with him. And probably most people actually going through the education system would think the same. I've certainly asked a number of students here, and they are under the impression that Charles Darwin really came up with it. But that is simply uh, not true. Often, in major paradigm shifts, they're called change of thinking, there have been many people before, and somebody happens to come along and develop the mechanism and launch it and publish it. So let's look at a quotation from Charles Darwin himself. He said, Until recently, the great majority of naturalists believed that species were immutable productions and had been separately created. This view has been ably maintained by many authors. Some few naturalists, on the other hand, have believed that species undergo modification and that the existing forms of life are the descendants by true generation of pre-existing forms. Passing over the allusions to the subject in classical writers, the first author who in modern times has treated it in a scientific spirit was Buffon. He was a chap from the Enlightenment period, the 18th century. Um, he was influential, along with people like Voltaire and, and others, for David Hume, who became the father of the Enlightenment movement here in Edinburgh. But this is the uh, Origin of Species, 6th edition, 1888. Now, it seems to me that Charles Darwin was under pressure from a number of people to say, look, put all the cards on the table. It wasn't just you. The credit is not just you, but there was actually a whole lot of other people before you who were discussing this subject. In fact, Charles Darwin, in his preface to the sixth edition, lists 21 or 22 scientists before him who held to this uh, theory of evolution. The passing over the allusions to the subject in classical writers is what's going to be my uh, thing I'm going to retarget on tonight. And he does actually, in this footnote, mention Aristotle. He says, we see here the principle of natural selection shadowed forth. And what are those? That references to Aristotle's uh, physics. And Aristotle is actually quoting something from a chap centuries before him called Empedocles. Talking about teeth, he's talking about uh, animal forms evolving uh, by chance. Well, it doesn't use the word evolving. And uh, discusses the development of teeth. Let's look a bit further on. Let's wind the clock further back than the classical Greek philosophers, right back to 1200 BC in India. Now, India had their own sort of enlightenment period, which went on for centuries. And here's a classic case of one chap, I guess, who was an agnostic. And he's saying, whence is this creation? The gods came afterwards with the creation of the universe. Who then knows whence it has arisen? Whence this creation has arisen? Perhaps it formed itself, or perhaps it did not. The one who looks down on it in the highest heaven, only he knows, or perhaps he does not know. So you might be a person just like that tonight, who's agnostic. You're not quite sure whether there's an intelligent designer behind it, or whether it all evolved by itself. Well, uh, you're in the same boat as this guy 3,200 years ago. Now, we're going to look, and this might be quite strange for you uh, to even consider, looking to Indian, Indian Brahmins, into Hinduism, going back thousands of years ago. And I'm looking at this section now, what's called, I've called the rise of the pantheistic evolutionists, who I, in my understanding and research, were the forerunners of evolutionary thinking. Now, pantheism, just in case you're not sure what that means, is basically the, the Hindu or pagan concept that God is everything. Nature is God. Um, and uh, so we will now look at a quotation, just so you see. Well, it was an interesting thing. When I began to research, I came across others who had actually gone before me and done research. And it's really nice when you actually find others are confirming stuff that you've been digging around yourself in the long hours and libraries. But here's a quotation from a man, Sir Monty Williams, who is a professor of Sanskrit, University of Oxford. Um, generally regarded as one of the leading experts in the study of uh, Hindu philosophy and Sanskrit, um, both in the 19th through to the early 20th century. He says, Indeed, the Hindus were Spinozists 2,000 years before the birth of Spinoza. 
Darwinian centuries before the birth of Darwin and evolutionists many centuries before the doctrine of evolution had been accepted by the Huxleys of our time and before any word like evolution existed in any language of the world. Now that's quite a statement. So now let's look at the source material of the Hindus. Well, they have a number of writings, the main ones being the Rig Vedas, written between about 1400 and 1000 BC, the Upanishads, written between about 800 and 400 BC, Bhagavad Gita, uh, about 500, Laws of Manu, about 200 BC, and the Mahabharata, between 400 BC and probably about AD 100. And within these scriptures of the Hindus, it's a combination of both religious thought and philosophical thought that come together. Bear that in mind as we go through. One of the first things you have to point out, if we're looking first of all at the cosmology before we even get into the biological understanding, is that the Hindus had an idea of an eternal universe, a cyclical universe. In other words, it's depicted there, as you see, as a, a serpent uh, with a tail in its mouth, kind of like a circle going round and round and round. The universe has an apparent beginning, has an end, starts again after a gap, has an end, has a beginning, has an end, and continues. Um, interesting enough, um, people like uh, Sir Fred Hoyle, who was um, a very well-known astrophysicist, was uh, very keen on the idea of an eternal universe. People sometimes called it um, uh, an oscillating universe, um, or other names were given to it. Um, and uh, no doubt, and I've seen some articles in Scientific American and also in uh, new scientists, that there are people even discussing the possibility of an eternal universe all over again. The popular view at the moment is singularity. Big Bang begins and it has just one start. But watch that space. So that's what the Hindus and most of the pagans believed in. Now then, let's look at another thing. Now in Hindu understanding, you had what's called a Trimurti, which is uh, the gods of Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva. Now, for the religious people, they were seen as gods, but for philosophical Hindus, Brahmins, they were also seen as principles. Brahma was seen to be the creative principle, Vishnu was seen to be the preserving principle, and Shiva the destroying principle. And if you see this diagram here, you see the circle representing the eternity of the universe. Within that, you're supposed to have the sort of equilateral triangle of the three gods or three principles. And... Our present universe takes place within those principles. Now let's have a look at um, one of the early quotations of the Hindus. The beginning of our present universe, an atomic particle. It says, he, that's Brahma, that's the creative principle, becomes the size of an atomic particle and brings to life this whole universe. In other words, you have this understanding, it began, our present universe is a tiny particle and all that was needed within that t particle for the whole universe and life and everything was contained within it in that creative process and everything came from it they have a kind of a big bang <clears throat> it says here and this is a reference about probably about 3,400 years ago from the Vedas after hundreds of millions of years he that's Brahman Brahman by the way in Hindu thinking is the entire universe with a consciousness within it. Split the egg, as they refer to, into parts, making heaven out of one and the earth out of the other. A lot of the pagan cultures referred to a cosmic egg uh, as the beginning. They had quite poetic and different explanations of it, quite amusing accounts, but essentially over and over again there was that kind of understanding in a kind of a simple form. They had an understanding of this expanding universe. It says by tapas, that's... Um, the heat or power of meditation uh, of, of Brahman, which is the universe, attains expansion and then comes primeval matter and from this comes life. In other words, what you have within the universe itself, Brahman, you have both...